Morning everyone, my name is Luigi Renzullo. Um, I'm a research scientist in the Fenner School of Environment Society. Um, I've got 20 years of experience working with satellite Earth observations and uh, key to any research in that area is understanding how solar radiation in interacts with our Earth's atmosphere. So uh, I have the great pleasure of taking the atmosphere component of the Blue Planet course and I hope you uh, enjoy my the next six lectures. So we'll start off with uh, radiation. Let me share my screen. So today we're going to cover uh, solar radiation and what happens when it propagates through Earth's atmosphere, that's called radiative transfer, and how that energy can be partitioned into energy that makes things happen on Earth, whether it be weather or um, growing plants. Uh, the energy output from the sun, by the time it travels the vast distances of space and gets to Earth's atmosphere, is about 180 petajoules per second. 180 petajoules per second at the top of Earth's atmosphere. Put it another way, that's more energy at the top of Earth's atmosphere from the sun per minute than Australia was able to generate from non-renewable energy sources in one year. Or in other words, in one minute, that's... 10,800 petajoules of energy. Our sun, uh, for those budding astronomers out there, is a what they call a main sequence star. It's just an ordinary star in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's just a run-of-the-mill five billion year old star. It's a middle aged, so we've got another about five billion years of energy left inside our sun. Um, it emits radiation equally in all direction, and that's about 3.8 five times 10 to the 26 joules per second in all directions. That's also referred to as 385 yotta watts. Uh, joules per second, you might know, is, is, a, is also known as a watt. It has a surface temperature, our sun, of about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, and it emits uh, shortwave radiation. Uh, it takes about eight minutes to get from the sun to Earth. So we'll talk a lot about uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, as you hopefully all know, anything that is above absolute zero in temperature, so that's minus 273 degrees Kelvin, emits electromagnetic radiation. Energy, uh, electromagnetic radiation propagates in the form of waves traveling at the speed of light. It's the fastest speed there is, 300,000 kilometers per second. Electromagnetic radiation is characterized by wavelengths. We'll talk about the wavelengths. And here we can see that you've got, uh, we can talk about long wavelength and short wavelength radiation, where long wavelengths, the distance between the crests is much greater than in the short wave radiation, where the distance between the, the peaks uh, is much shorter. So to go in a little bit more detail, we'll talk about wavelength. It's often characterized um, depicted by the uh, Greek letter lambda. So to give you some sense of scale here, um, you know, we can break a meter down into a hundred centimeters or a thousand millimeters. But when we talk about electromagnetic radiation, uh, we talk in the sort of units called microns or nanometers. Um, and so in terms of one meter, that's a million microns or a thousand million or a billion nanometers. And we talk about wavelengths as the distance peak to peak or trough to trough. That's our wavelength. And the, uh, what we call the, um, the time between one peak and the other is one cycle. Another way to talk about radiation is in terms of its frequency. So that's, if you like, the number of peaks you encounter per second or the number of cycles per unit of time. One cycle per second is one hertz. Hertz is the measure of frequency. And if you look at that in a, um, uh, a time series, one cycle, you have two cycles, three cycles. So this would be electromagnetic radiation where in one second, there's two and a quarter cycles in one second or 2.25 hertz. Given we have the wavelength and the frequency of radiation, we can calculate the speed. 
and electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. And hopefully we all know that that's the fastest speed there is, 300,000 kilometers per second, or three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, and we can talk about, say, visible light. If we look at, say, the green part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's a wavelength of about 0 0.55 microns, and that's a frequency of 5.45 times 10 to the 5 gigahertz, where giga is 10 to the 9. So we're talking in uh, this scientific notation because these numbers are either very, very small or very, very big. Uh, alternatively, we can think about microwave radiation and talk in terms of frequency. So um, the, a lot of the microwave radiation data that um, you'll be working with, if you, any, any of you continue in Earth system science, uh, is in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And there we refer to it, it in terms of frequency. Uh, 1.5 gigahertz is also called L-band, um, but that corresponds to a wavelength of about 20 centimeters. So as I said, we've got a, a, a big electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. And what our eyes pick up is a very narrow region uh, of a much greater uh, spectrum, uh, much larger spectrum. Um, we see visible light from uh, violet through to red. Um, and so when we talk about violet and blues, we're talking about 350, 400 nanometers, um, or uh, in, in red with 750 or 0.75 microns. I, I switch between microns and nanometers because in, in my trade, um, we sort of do the, the very quick mental arithmetic um, and uh, it's, it's very common to switch between those two units measuring wavelength. So as I said, all objects that are above zero, point, uh, zero Kelvin emit radiation. Objects that emit the maximum radiation they possibly can is called a black body. But not all radiation comes out as a single wavelength, but it comes out as a distributed spectrum. And that spectrum takes the form of what's called the Planck function. And here's an example where the intensity per unit wavelength of radiation uh, is displayed as this Planck function, where we have the peak of the radiation corresponding to a wavelength that we can physically interpret uh, its meaning with respect to its interaction with the atmospheric components or the surface uh, or, the radio, uh, uh, or the land surface. Uh, so, yep, so we've got black body radiation characterized by a Planck function. Um, and cooler objects emit in the longer wavelength region of the electromagnetic spectrum compared to warmer objects. Hotter objects tend to emit in the shorter wavelength. Here we have two idealized uh, black body uh, Planck functions. Um, it, on the left, we have the black body spectrum we would get from the sun, for example, with a surface temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin. So you can see the peak there in the um, function corresponds to roughly the, um, the, the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Not surprisingly, we can see the sun and it gives us all the uh, light we see to get around and function on Earth. Um, whereas if you think of something a bit more like the Earth, it's a lot cooler and it's emitting around about the um, three, uh, two, 300 Kelvin uh, on average across the whole Earth, if you like, and it's emitting in the longer wavelength region of the electromagnetic spectrum. But, but you're not getting a single wavelength, you're getting a distribution, and the distributions are characterized by these Planck black body curves. Uh, a, a really neat uh, law to uh, relate the wavelength of radiation and uh, the temperature of a, um, a, an object is, this, is through Wien's displacement law. The idea is that if you know the temperature that a body is emitting, then you can work out the peak in the Planck function curve as lambda max. Uh, alternatively, if you know the wavelength uh, of the uh, emitted peak, um, then you can interpret the, uh, the temperature of that body um, by rearranging the Wien's displacement law. So that's a very neat um, uh, relationship by basically taking the derivative of the Planck function 
uh, at e setting it equal to zero and then inverting the frame function, but that's uh, outside the scope of this course. So for the a, a, a sun with a surface temperature of about five, 6,000 Kelvin, uh, that corresponds to a maximum in the um, Planck's function of about 0.5 microns. So that's roughly the green, yellowy green uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum. But remember that the peak is kind of broad as well. So it encompasses a bit, of, bit more of the uh, um, uh, visible spectrum. Earth, however, the average temperature across the Earth is about 17 degrees Celsius, which is about 290 Kelvin. Uh, and that corresponds to a maximum in the Planck uh, black body function of uh, 15 microns. So that's in uh, what's called the thermal infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we talk about the Planck's uh, Planck function. Here's the actual uh, emission from the, the sun. And so it's not as smooth as those idealized curves you saw previously. These bumps and wiggles all correspond to uh, absorption of the emitted radiation from the sun by the sun's outer atmosphere. Uh, the elements that are uh, generated in the sun can absorb the emissions of the uh, shortwave radiation. And uh, yeah, it, le it results in this sort of less than smooth <laughs> curve uh, for the Planck uh, um, function. We call this the solar spectral irradiance. And um, if we do the integral of this function over all wavelengths, what we find is that we get a value of total energy output of about 1365 watts per square meter. That's what we call the solar constant. So that's the intensity of solar radiation at the top of Earth's atmosphere. Um, is 1365 watts per square meter, solar constant. We talk about a constant, but if we look at how it may vary over time, you can see that uh, this time series here of a solar constant measured by various spaceborne observation techniques uh, shows anything but a constant. In fact, you can see the very high frequency, uh, uh, I guess this is month to month or year to year variation but there is a, a slow varying cycle here. And this is about 11 year cycle between the minima or the maxima of this, uh, of the solar constant. Um, and uh, when you look at what they might correspond to, they, they line up very nicely uh, with sunspots or solar flares. Um, and those of you know a little bit about the impact of solar flares, they, they have the potential to knock out Earth's telecommunication network. Um, and in fact, I think uh, there is precedence in history that uh, demonstrates that um, a severe, um, uh, severe solar storms can lead to knocking out power networks uh, on Earth as well as telecommunication networks. There's a whole growing branch of uh, meteorology devoted to monitoring solar activity at the top of Earth's atmosphere, what they call space weather. Um, or purely because um, these are things you need to monitor and they have the potential of impacting um, uh, our, our telecommunications on Earth. So the solar constant varies, uh, has high frequency variation, but we can see on average is about 1365, 1366 watts per square meter. And I think I'll uh, pause there for a minute. All right, so we're back. Uh, now we want to uh, think about what happens as, as we distribute the uh, solar energy at the top of Earth's atmosphere over the whole surface of the Earth. So here we're, uh, uh, we have the solar radiation. As it gets, travels the vast distances of space, uh, we're talking about 150 million uh, kilometers uh, journey. By the time the solar radiation gets to Earth, it's effectively parallel beams of radiation. And you, hopefully you should be able to see that the, uh, in terms of intensity, that solar radiation has a maximum um, intensity uh, around the equator. Um, and as you move towards the poles, north or south, 
uh, that same energy is distributed over a larger surface area, which decreases the intensity. So we talk about the incoming normal uh, solar irradiance at a given um, latitude on Earth, and it's given by this expression here. The idea to take away from this is that it's uh, concentrated at the equator um, because that energy is over a smaller area compared to as you move towards the poles where the distance between these arrows, if you like, is much greater and therefore the solar energy is distributed over a much larger area, decreasing the intensity. Um, and if you want to go ahead and do the uh, surface area calculations, you can estimate that the solar power at the top of Earth's atmosphere, if we take the solar constant and distribute it over the um, surface area of the Earth that's illuminated by the sun, um, we get that total solar power at the top of Earth's atmosphere to be about 1365 watts per square meter. That's the solar constant. And if you integrate that over one minute, we're getting about um, 10,800 petajoules over the surface of the Earth. And as I said, that uh, in one minute, those 10,800 petajoules uh, of uh, solar energy is uh, roughly equivalent to what Australia has generated um, over a year uh, in uh, previous records. This is from the Department of Environment and Energy demonstrating that the total energy outputs uh, on average over the last uh, 40 years or so um, has is about the same as what we get at the top of Earth's atmosphere in one minute from the sun. Um, what happens to all that solar radiation? And that's going to be the topic of the next video. So bear with me while I stop recording.